so thank you everybody for, for coming in, in large numbers and uh, thank you the online audience as well for, for joining us tonight. This is uh, another Club of Rome salon where we are looking at different, different perspectives of sustainability tonight uh, uh, with the title Shaping a Sustainable World and International Collaboration and Transformation for a Healthy Planet. My name is Jörg Geier, I'm wearing a couple of different hats uh, for on behalf of the, the Club of Rome, uh, Germany and International, also the Arts and Nature Social Club. And you've already heard our musicians, uh, the Berlin Metropole Trio featuring Bartilla. And they will play a very special song for you called uh, The Nature Song. It is, it, it, it'll be in German and it focuses on the integration uh, really of nature and, and, and people. Uh, the fact that we are all part of one uh, system and not really separated as many people say and uh, I will say a bit more about the event in general um, and uh, our distinguished speakers and uh, our partners as well but uh, first uh, we listen to another song featuring Batilla, uh, the singer of the nature song. Sag's mir, 
sind wir nur ein Stück Natur, wie die Wasser klar, so blau, so pur. Ich weiß, dass du das weißt. Also sehr vergessen nur der Blick auf dies ganze Weltgeschick. Sag mir, was bringt die Zeit? So thank you again, uh, Berlin Metropole Trio featuring Bartilla, and they will be able to listen to uh, a few more songs later on. But uh, just a few words on, on the topic. The emphasis of this uh, event is on collaboration and solutions. So that's why we have representatives from Science, Sandrine Dixon de Clerf, uh, co-president of the Club of Rome, Luisa Neubauer, uh, uh, the face of Friday for Future, Fridays for Future in, in Germany. And uh, I don't think I need to elaborate much more. And uh, um, uh, Axel Berger uh, from uh, the family-owned uh, multi-billion dollar, uh, dollar company, uh, Haniel, um, f um, Chief Sustainability Officer. And uh, we have various partners that I'd like to point out, as often uh, this an event like this is not possible without uh, a whole range of different partners. So Hotel de Rome is, is our hosting partner, Con Climate, uh, and Dr. Christian Reisinger will also welcome you uh, in, a, in a few minutes. And uh, then we have uh, Fording Walls Foundation, uh, Fulbright Germany, fairplanet.org, and um, Clever Elements and Easy Livestream as technology partners. Um, Fair Planet is a uh, journalism platform that uh, is focused on solutions journalism. And uh, if you would like to talk to them, they've got a representative here, Yossi Reich. And uh, I especially like what they do because uh, they do focus on solutions. And if there's anything we need desperately, it's solutions to the existing crisis. Crises. But uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Christian Reisinger to say a few more words about Con Climate and also a book they will be handing out later called Klimakurve Kriegen, uh, which means uh, uh, getting, getting your act together from a climate to climate perspective. Thank you very much. The microphone will be taken away. You can just take this one. Okay, perfect. So, well, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, don't worry, I don't. Uh, uh, I, I won't uh, talk too much about con climate in my company now. Um, what I find more interesting is to tell you uh, what fascinates me, or what has always fascinated me about the Club of Rome, because the Club of Rome has always been a source of inspiration for me, actually, from the first days of my studies, and it was, it was precisely one of the the first books uh, uh, that got into my hands when I started my studies at the University of St. Gallen some 20 years ago, The Limits to Growth, of course. And um, the basic idea there appeared quite logic to me. 
that you know eternal exponential growth just won't turn out good uh, in the long run. It's not uh, rocket science that you need to understand so that the Club of Rome or the, the scientists behind the, the Club of Rome study used a big computer model to prove that. Um, but it's, it's, it's not much more than, than pure mass that tells you that something needs to change and that was already or became already apparent quite a long time ago. Now we stand here 50 years after the Limits to Growth was published and we have to ask ourselves, what have we learned? Have we developed alternative concepts to the growth paradigm? Have we finally understood that our world's resources are limited and that there are planetary boundaries that are non-negotiable? Well, my answer is yes and no. It's, unfortunately, it's more a no than a yes, but let's stay on the positive side here. So, um, definitely it's a no because our economy is still very much based on the, you know, economic growth paradigm. Without economic growth, uh, we have, you know, trouble paying for our social pension systems. We have trouble, you know, uh, for pretty much financing the transition that we need so desperately, like the energy transition, all the windmills, um, all the heat pumps that we need now. Uh, to some extent, we still need economic growth, uh, growth in order to achieve that. But it's also a yes because I slowly see the new paradigm or see new paradigms arising where growth uh, and economic value are defined in a broader, in a more holistic sense. And where a company's success is no longer purely defined in terms of profits. One example for this paradigm shift is the value balancing alliance, which was presented here at this forum, I think it was two years ago. Yes, also, because sustainability and I can confirm that from my everyday doings, has never been more at the center of attention than it is today. We now have a compulsory sustainability standard in the EU effectively obliging more than 50,000 uh, companies to develop a profound sustainability strategy. This is new and this has not uh, existed before. So I am convinced that this is to a big extent the achievement also Luisa Neubauer, uh, very much of the Fridays for Future movement and similar movements because I am convinced that without you, we wouldn't be at the point uh, we are currently at. So thank you very much for your work. I think this was really the game changer. Um, and, and this accelerator that, you know, kept us getting here. All right, so... Um, to close my, my welcoming speech, um, I'm very much looking forward to the debate now, uh, to the discussion, uh, to the presentations we will have, um, and I wish us all a very uh, um, yeah, entertaining, inspiring evening. Have a lot of fun. Thank you. from uh, Con Climate and we'll begin with Sandrine Dixon de Clef, co-president of the Club of Rome and she's wearing many more hats that she'll be able to point out to you and uh, then we'll follow with uh, Luisa Neubauer and uh, Axel Berger but without further ado I'd like to hand over to Sandrine. Um. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure for me to be here, and it's a pleasure to have had a musical interlude to open up this very important panel. I think we all underestimate the importance of culture and arts in the way in which we're going to be able to get through the complexity of this 21st century. So thank you. Very important. That is part of the transformation, and that's also part of the collaboration. And I won't go into those details, but I think we do need to remember that every single actor in society has a role to play. And in particular, when we start to talk about the elephants in the room, because there are many. I won't talk about mental illness growing or suicide rates, but I would like to refer in particular to some of the key elephants that are really stopping us from, as we were just told, shifting from that extractive economy that we've all become so addicted to. We know that the effort to fight the climate crisis and other environmental crises 
remain focused on the supply side and technological solutions. And if you look at the United States, and I have an American accent, but I'm actually French-Belgian, it is very clear that the obsession with technology to get us out of the mess that we've created is the reason why we continue to be in the mess that we created. We need to look at not only the supply side, but we need to look at the demand side, and we need, most importantly, to address poverty and inequality, which is growing across the globe. And there are solutions to that. The question is, are we ready to actually address those solutions? We have to also address the inherent wastefulness of our addiction. We have to start thinking about how we can optimize our society and our ways to shift from continuous materialism and a capitalistic system that is very much based on an extractive economy. And, and that means that we have to address equity. And we also have to address social tipping points. And I'll lead you through some of the new research that we've undertaken, in particular when we've undertaken our 50th commemoration of the limits to growth in the program of work called Earth for All, and that has become a book called Earth for All, Survival Guide for Humanity, translated and actually published here in Germany first. So let me move into the next key issues, because part of the solutions are the ones that are the most difficult, and that is how we actually shift our financial, our governance, and our economic architecture. What does that actually look like? When we know so clearly that if we continue to talk about the elephants in the room, that both in the North, it is the wealthiest that have the highest amount of consumption and therefore CO2 emissions, but also in comparison between the North and the South, it is clearly the North that continues to consume the most. And you can see that from all the material footprinting analysis that we have. You can see that in terms of how much actually of the impact is per country, also per GDP growth. And you can see it from the way in which the percentile shows very clearly that the poorest 50% are responsible for only about 10% of total lifestyle emissions. So we have a deep failure in our economic system. And that means that we need to address the reality, the big elephant in the room, which is we are not meeting basic human needs to ensure dignity. And a translation of that is what's happened here in terms of the farmers' riots and the pushback from farmers. A translation is what's happening across Europe in terms of energy poverty. Where I don't, we don't need to go to Ethiopia or look at starving children to understand that inequality is here in front of us. And if any of you have been to San Francisco recently, you will have seen the greatest amount of homelessness, drug addiction that we've ever had. And this is the Bay Area where I grew up where most people saw the dot-com boom and where none of it has trickled down to enhance people's lives and livelihoods. So we have to figure out how do we actually meet those basic needs within planetary boundaries? What does that look like? How do we shift from an extractive GDP economy into an economy that services people, planet, and prosperity at the same time? How do we take into account social and environmental risk? We've been talking about this forever. How do we cost externalities? What does that look like? You can go back to the very famous Stern report in terms of the costs and benefits of actually shifting into a green economy. We know that we can do it. The question is, do we have leaders that are willing to do it? We have to expand our perspective of public goods. We have to understand the role of the state and we need to understand private capital as well as public capital. But most importantly as well, we need to understand how do we actually break that differential between high and low income economies and how also do we decrease inequality within our own economies. And part of that solution, and I see some women in this room, but still many men, is the fact that we need to give women more agency. We need to have more diversity in our governments, but also in particular in the global south, where women should have more access to education, because we know that the flip side of that is a stronger economy and also an insurance that population numbers will go down. So what did we do at the Club of Rome? We took our knowledge from the limits to growth 
and the knowledge of the planetary boundaries, working with Potsdam Institute and Johann Rockström, and we integrated that knowledge into what we call Earth for All, a survival guide for humanity, using a system dynamic model to understand what are those alternative futures. And we actually came up with two scenarios. The too little, too late scenario, basically it's business as usual, or the giant leap scenario, how can we create that economic transformation? And this is just a cut. Yeah, there, there's the solution. Don't you see it? <laughs> we all know that there are interrelationships across different factors and indicators, but I think what truly came out from this, which was so important, and even Johan Rockström, who is one of the authors of this great work, was to understand that the speed of action on the planetary boundaries is a function of the speed of action and change of inequality and poverty. That is most important. That actually we need to reduce global poverty. And through the giant leap, we're able to already start almost having global poverty by 2040. We do the same in terms of inequality by putting in place five key turnarounds. Those turnarounds being poverty alleviation, inequality decrease, ensuring actually that we empower women, looking at transforming the food and energy systems. And that cost is about 2 to 4% of global GDP. Now, why is this so important? Because we know it's complex. You saw it from the graph. We know it's going to be difficult. But we're feeling it right now. What's the pain point? The pain point is as inequality grows, and you can see in the United States, and this is just a snapshot, it reduces trust. Reduction of trust means that it has an impact on social tension, it has an impact on democracies, it has an impact on moving towards the radical right. And again, we're seeing that across Europe. But what's so important here, I just want to point you to a few key data points. The most important one for me, which is a scandal. Since 1978, CEO salaries in the United States have grown by 1,400%. 1,400%. An employee by 18% and inflation by about 30%. I'd be pretty pissed off if I wasn't a CEO. Because the fact of the matter is that shareholder value has taken over our entire financial and economic system. That our economy is over-financialized, which basically means that we don't control our economy. Money does. Profit does. That's a total shift from what the economy was supposed to do. It was supposed to be the underbelly of how we as a society could function. The underbelly of achieving well-being. So what we've done is we've put forward a social tension index which shows very clearly that unless you put in place the giant leap scenario, social tension will increase. And unless you start to shift, well-being will decrease. And in fact, life satisfaction has already decreased across most of the North and the Western countries. So I'm going to end with this. This is a presentation, believe it or not, that I gave at Wall Street they probably never knew what would hit them. We actually, and my colleague Till is here, were flabbergasted at the fact that we were allowed to go into Wall Street, that Earth for All was featured across the floor on Wall Street. But this is what I said to them. Uncontrollable growth and an over-financialized economy will crowdfund disaster. It is time to change the rules of the game so people, planet, and prosperity come first before power and profit. The only way to build resilience to future shocks and stresses is to invest in an earth for all. Mark my words, there are no stocks, no bonds, no financial assets, no business prospects, no jobs on an unstable or dead planet. So ladies and gentlemen, we will not have collaboration or actually shape a sustainable world if we do not take into consideration growing inequality and poverty the compound effects of the poly crisis are in front of us now. We need to think through how do we bring forward the leadership that is necessary to enable us to move forward. We have five key turnarounds. We have recommendations. We know we have the technology. We have most of the solutions. What it takes is brave leadership from all of us and the countries across the globe. Thank you very much.
So these are actually the audience questions for, for discussion later on. So if we could go back to the first slide, that would be great. Uh, then you'll just see the overview of speakers. But uh, the next speaker will be Axel Berger from Haniel. And maybe you can just say a few more words about the company you work for and uh, the mission of your company and uh, how uh, it may be addressing some of the points that um, Sandrine uh, so eloquently pointed out. Yeah, that's extremely difficult to connect the, to that because um, a lot of the topics that you touched I actually wanted to talk about. But first of all, who is Haniel? Haniel is a 267-year-old um, um, uh, fam still family-owned company. Uh, we are part of the problem. Uh, we have been in coal, we have been in steel. So uh, the, actually the first um, the hole in Essen where we actually got through, the thick, uh, to, uh, through to the thick coal uh, that was actually ours. So um, my future dream is that at some point we create um, um, biological coal or uh, carbon and bring it back into these uh, mines, which will not going suppose, uh, supposedly not going to happen. But um, well, we four years ago we shifted our approach um, because we have uh, proven over decades that with the old um, simply total shareholder return approach we were not successful. So we were looking at what is going to change in the future, and um, well, it came up. We already came up years before with a ter German term called Enkelfähig, which you could probably translate into grandchildable. Um, and now it started to fill that with life. Um, what that means for us is entrepreneurship in the 21st century, which is in balance between economy, ecology, and social responsibility. So we would like to talk about opportunity because there will be a huge gap between. The system change, which is necessary, um, and now. Because um, what we see is that a lot of family-owned companies in Germany, um, they, they feel they've done so much. They've always been socially responsible, build schools and support schools and um, health care for their employees, etc., etc. Um, but then they, they never really embarked to the problems that we have today. And they still work with um, in, or economic systems which are 60 years old. Um, invented in a time, business of business is business, when we had 3.7 billion people on this planet and not eight. Um, probably the, the resources at this time were imagined to be unlimited, the resources of the earth, and they're not. We know that today. But now, how do you overcome the, in my point of view, dysfunctional market? Um, because ex costs are socialized and externalized. Um, it's, it's, it feels some somehow like an ideology saying business of business is business. And the market cannot work freely and openly because it does not recognize all costs, which is a problem. And we will not change that in, in the years to come. So um, what we wanted to, to develop is something um, that gives hope. Um, so to say, or opportunity um, that also will be able to somehow save the wealth that we have um, established over the years because we are losing out to other, um, to other countries. Um, in Germany, you, obviously everybody's aware we have been the, the greatest car manufacturers on, in the world probably and now we see Chinese cars on our streets for the first time. So. And they are coming with EVs and not with combustion engine. So we are losing out on that. We are losing out on heat pumps, which is a future technology. Um, it's, it's a growth market. But we feel in Germany that we are um, in a bubble, that we cannot uh, create wealth with that, um, not understanding that we are fourth last in the installation of heat pumps in Europe. Um, so here we are. Um, we will not change the economic system um, as such. So what we need is um, opportunity entrepreneurship, um, some, some um, skills that we used to have and probably we lost over time. Um, and we need to see the opportunity in this transformation. Um, I'm perfectly also clear that um, just technology will not save us. But um, when, I, when I'm on the German motorway and I see how well the so-called Reißverschluss system is working, so letting each other in front, um, I'm pretty sure that we will not change this world with just changing the behavior of people. It's the hardest thing that we can do. So what, what we try to, to focus on is the story with Enkefeg um, to, to think entrepreneurial and to see the opportunity in that transformation and to make sustainability profitable. Because the one thing that this economic system can do is 
scale, big time. And so I'm not sure if this, it, it will not be the final solution, but um, we think we, we, we need to use that economic system to scale sustainability and create an opportunity for, for family-owned businesses, but also for big businesses to scale sustainability. And the ultimate goal would be to internalize the externalized costs. Um, then the market could function again, and then everybody who's market liberal would, would, would probably be right. The market can work by itself, but this is not going to happen. So here we are. Um, we would like to offer an, op an alternative, an opportunity in um, thinking incafeic and um, creating business with and through sustainability, not although we are sustainable, which is hard nowadays because customers are not willing to pay for it right now. A bit more on the B2B side than on the B2C side. <coughs> Um, but we hope that this will come um, and that we can somehow thereby create some op uh, entrepreneurial thinking again. So, yeah, that's, that's what we are striving for and that's what we try to, to develop and to push. And hopefully, um, with now founding an association, which is called the Enkelfähig Association, where we try to bring together um, family-owned businesses and um, entrepreneurs um, to start the transformation out of their own responsibility instead of being pushed by regulation, uh, we hope that we can convince other companies to go the same path. So intergenerational justice uh, embodied in the, the company culture, and we'll surely talk more about it later. But uh, now, um, Luisa Neubauer will certainly point out a few more thoughts and ideas um, uh, in response to the other two speakers. Thank you so much. I will make it quick so we have some more time for uh, discussion later on. First of all, Sandrine, I think we must thank you that you're speaking about the problems we have with the top 1% in a place that is probably, um, you know, built for no one else but the top 1%. And I hope that all, um, yeah, well, that this room was uh, rightly so felt, um, was made feeling a bit uncomfortable on that end, because this is about um, acknowledging the um, disasters caused by the privileged, by the most privileged around the world. Um, and we need rules for those privileges and we need to end some of those privileges, but most of all, we need the privilege to reflect and to act on their own privileges. Um, so much on the setting. Um, yeah, I would... Yeah, you know the saying, when the establishment applauds the revolution, um, there's something wrong in the room, but never mind. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we go along, and I would just add three, um, three quick points. Um, coming from all the ideas that are out there, what to do about that. Um, and I would say, or I would start with the notion that given that this night is about collaboration, and you know this room obviously wants to reflect some of that collaboration, and Sandrina's uh, the person of collaboration and so on and so forth. I would um, first argue we cannot collaborate without um, causing conflict. Because if there's collaboration without conflict, um, it's cheap lies. It's um, nothing but a wishful thinking of some peace um, that cannot be made without acknowledging the differences. So when we speak about how to come together to solve those very problems pointed out before, let's acknowledge those who have caused it, Let's um, acknowledge that we are not, even in 2024, sitting all on the same table, that we're not all on the same page, and that we have a real issue with those wandering around what the markets will, what the markets will bring in the future, whilst ignoring that those looking for the markets in the future are very likely to have caused the disasters of those ver that very future. And it is, we as Fridays for Future, we just turned five years old and I find it quite dangerous that by now everyone is talking about the climate, everyone wants to do something, everyone is a bit of a sustainability officer. If it's in a company or in a family or in a, wherever in a bar, everyone has to say something, which is in a sense, of course, beautiful. We need people to talk about these things, but we need to acknowledge that there is a gap between the words and the action and that gap is out there. It's most visible and obviously the dirtiest companies around the world who all by, by now present us some climate targets, but who keep profiting and keep growing and keep expanding to the expense of all of us. 
and our lives and livelihoods. And that is out there. And I think it was mainly, uh, maybe the most visible at the climate conference at the COP, where Sandrine and me and many others were fighting against a, uh, an uprising, I would say, of fossil fuel interests who had tried to hide themselves under, behind sustainability targets and who kind of came up last minute to say, by the way, we would still like some fossil fuels in the future. We know it's a bit of an issue with the livelihoods, but you know it's great. And those stories aren't, and they're not even trying to hide themselves anymore that well. They're out there. And so this, you know, and obviously that accounts for every, for every company, for every holding. Um, challenge yourself. And, you know, otherwise you will be challenged, certainly. Are we saying something? Are we doing something? And there's a gap, there's a difference. Um, then I think the second um, issue following up on the idea that now everyone talks about the climate is the fact that now even so many institutions and many people are doing, you know, great stuff about the climate. I would say there's a great danger in technocrizing our survival. So there was an issue, the, the, the ecological emergency, and we have now great, great sentences, great numbers that can show us what we should do and we must do. And now everyone who is even out of the best intentions doing something can present some of those numbers. And suddenly we're not talking about existence anymore. We're talking about numbers. We're talking about a little paragraphs and little graphs that are going up and down. And so we are getting soaked up. We're getting so busy um, and, and taken away by all the little numbers and graphs that by the end of the day, we hear someone here singing about nature and maybe for the first time in a while acknowledge, oh, it's actually about not just some numbers. It's about us. It's about the survival. And we here obviously account to some of the most privileged people in the world. So it's great to do something, but it's not enough to do something about the emergency. We must ring the alarm bell at all times to make sure not for a single second someone out there gets to forget why we are doing this. This is not a great investment strategy. This is not a green project. This is not a great ecological transition we can do. No, this is a fight for survival, and that's a great difference. And if people do not get to make that distinction when we speak about what we do, or what has been done, or what needs to be done, then something is really deeply wrong about that. Let's not technocrize the survival of living beings on the planet. And and the um, and thirdly, I would just um, um, start with my uh, bringing my grandmother to the conversation. My grandmother is 91. She's a wonderful woman, and for the past 50 years, she has been reading and doing everything she thought she can do about the climate and the, the questions of peace and sustainability and women's rights. And she has this bookshelf in her living room with, I would say, the majority of the climate literature of the past 50 years. Everyone is, um, that everything is in there. And I mean, it's obviously just depressing to see that the titles of the book written in 97 and, 90, and in 2020 are basically the same. Though I think they used to be a bit more radical. Wen macht die Banane krumm? It's one of my favorites. Um, so, and my grandmother looks at the shelf of books, and I think many of us have a kind of collection, probably by now, of those books in the room, and we see the plants, we see the slides by Sandrine, we see, you know, how everything is out there. And we point to that and we say, oh, we only must do that. And we even have the economic um, uh, vision to us saying, you know, it would even kind of make sense, you know, in terms of economies and so on. It, 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 it just makes so much sense. So why are we failing still? Why is it that even though the numbers are out there, the markets are crashing, the, the, the poverty, the inequality, everything is out there, why is it um, that we're still failing? And why is it that those books and the bookshelf of my grandmother are turning her more towards cynicism than towards joy? Because she feels those books as a burden to her, knowing we've been know knowing all that all along. In, 90s, in the 1970s, we had the first solar panels on the White House. Why the hell are we still where we are? And I would just add, I mean, there are a trillion things that are missing in the conversation, but one thing is the learnings from James Bond. Why is James Bond a great story to us? 
not only is because, you know, it's, it's a man is front and center. James Bond is a great story because there's someone coming with a fossil machine that will save us quick and dirty without us having to change anything. And so it's so nice to believe that, you know, something by the end of the day, there will be a James Bond, a man in a machine come to save us. Now we're having to deal with Elon Musk for the sake of it. Okay. Yeah. So the question is, and you know, James Bond in a way impersonalizes a dream of um, a good story that is too good to not to tell, to not to watch. It's something that's aesthetic. It's something that's nice to look at. It's something to nice to even wish for. We all wish him the best. It is great to know there's this one guy and he does his stuff. James Bond, by the way, would never come by train or by bike, right? He has to come by car also. It tells us a lot about the last century. So what do all these superhero have in, uh, stories have in common? They're, they're giving us something. With all the plans and all the ideas and all the graphs and all the plots, we have the numbers, that's great, but we do not have the stories and we do not have the dreams. And if we acknowledge that by changing everything, we are ruining, we're taking away so many of the old dreams of the last century, we need to be able to produce new dreams, new stories, new aesthetics, new words, new languages, new musics, new sounds, to fill that void that is out there. Because otherwise, people will cling to old and outdated stories and visions of how an economy has to run and how a family has to run and how a country has to run forever. If we do not find those better stories to tell that are so good that even though you hate the Greens, you hate the climate activists, you hate everything, it's too good not to even check it out for a moment. And I think that's where we are. Thank you so much. So thanks very much for some beautiful introductory words and an art uh, keeps coming up. You pointed it out, Sandrine, uh, you pointed it out, uh, Luisa, and that's also what Arts and Nature Social Club is about. Uh, one of the two co-hosting organizations, which is really about bringing people together under, the, under one umbrella, focus on art, science and uh, business, and, how, and, and having a dialogue on how to integrate different aspects and to think in more interdiscipl interdisciplinary terms. And uh, the beautiful music by Berlin Met Metropole uh, Trio and uh, featuring Batilla, they also showed uh, that emotions are very important, dreams are very important in order to form uh, new stories. And I very much agree with your point that we, to some extent, take the economic laws as laws of nature, and that's a narrative we need to change. So that's something I'd like to touch upon upon in different ways during the Q&A session, but maybe you've got a few more things to say on changing the narrative and the economic system um, being not uh, a natural law and law of nature. Uh, some people also criticize the uh, Nobel Prize uh, for economics as not actually being a Nobel Prize, but uh, being a, a Bank of uh, Sweden Prize, uh, which is not the same as, as the Nobel Prize. So, um, so yeah, Sodrine, if you could maybe respond and just add a few more thoughts. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you, Louisa, as always, bringing such incredible wisdom into the room. Um, you brought in your grandmother. I'm going to bring in my daughter, um, who's a singer. And, um, and I think it's very important, first of all, at, at this time that we admit, exactly as Louisa has indicated, the pain the pain of transformation, but that we quickly bring in what then, when you pass through the pain, does the future look like? Let us not forget that we had the Second World War, incredibly painful part of our history, and that there were incredibly brave men and women who fought through that war and rebuilt Europe. You can talk about the same in terms of apartheid. You can talk about the same in terms of visionary alternative futures. Many of us are now building those futures. Whether you look at it through what I've shown to you and the different solutions through our scenarios, or whether you look at the conversations we're having with storytellers and narrative builders. But the story right now, Jörg, and for all of us, is twofold. 
As Louisa rightly said, we have put in place a series of objectives at the European level where actually much of our economy has started to transform. We're in the midst of a positive tipping point. But here's the story, and I'm going to point, and I don't know your name, to the lovely woman over there who's a friend of Louisa's, who's wearing a collar that says love and hate. And it really spoke to me, because that's the conversation we're right ha now having. That positive storyline is turning into a hate story rather than a love story. And we need to bring it back to the love story. Now, who's breeding the hate? It's the radical right. It's the radical right in this country, in my country, in Belgium, in Holland, in Portugal, across Europe, who somehow has seized nature as part of our core, as bad for farmers and citizens and everyone else. Now, excuse me, how the fuck did we let that happen? Apologies for my language, but how did we let that happen? How have we let them hijack our essence? Nature and climate is our survival. And no one is standing up, except for Fridays in the Future and a few others, saying, hold on a second. Now, if we want European elections that build a narrative of hope and of love, we need to act, all of us, collectively, right now, to show people what that means. That means absolutely empowering the farmer, regaining our rural communities so that they feel that they're not disenfranchised, but they're actually part of a country. That they have a reason for being, that we give them the right pricing. Now, this is quite easy to fix. Our subsidies are not supporting our farmers. Our subsidies are supporting big ag. Our energy assistance is not supporting people. It's windfall profits of 2.8 per day, billion dollars that is, for oil and gas companies. So there is a positive narrative. There is a narrative of love. There is a way to transform many of our perversities in our markets in terms of functionalities that enable people to not only survive but to thrive but it is our responsibility to stand up right now and tell the radical right don't you hijack my life and create such fear and such hate when actually we were just about to start to transform So Axel, maybe you can add to that and uh, explain the reasons why has Haniel been so courageous and why are other major players in industry rather, than, uh, rather hesitant in embracing, uh, let's call it the sustainable transformation? Well, first of all, I'm not sure if we are so super courageous and obviously we are um, discussing these things over and over again, um, especially when, when obviously economic um, downturn happens, then everything is questioned again. Um, obviously, we are fighting against um, this to happen, but, um, well, what do I see? Um, first of all, again, there is um, the lack of um, willingness to transform, uh, and I see that in all companies. Obviously, I see that in society, and there is not this um, this um, song of love or this opportunity um, showing them the way. Um, it's, it's all fear about need to change, it's fear about cost, it's fear about um, losing power, losing wealth, um, losing status, um, and that's very difficult to overcome. Um, I mean, um, from a logical perspective, I guess these, a lot of people are um, well enough educated to understand the logics behind it and that, this, and that we cannot f move on as we did in the past. But still, it's change. And um, I mean, whenever you try to change a company and transform a company, it doesn't matter for if it's a sustainability transformation or digital transformation or whatsoever, it's probably the hardest thing to do. 
And that's something that we need to acknowledge because um, if we don't take people along on the journey, um, we will lose them to the, to, to the, to the hard right. And we've, we are currently seeing that all over the place. Um, so I, I, I don't want to talk about narratives because it always uh, sounds like a, um, a green storytelling. But to some extent, we need something like it. We need to show the opportunity because otherwise we will lose these people and we will lose the companies and we will lose the entrepreneurs and nothing will change. That's the hard consequence of this, um, if we like it or not. And I, I like the idea of always ringing the alarm bell, but it's not working because you will create, and we, are, we see that we create resistance. Um, and yeah, I, we don't have another, uh, we, we didn't find another solution in, instead of uh, creating um, yeah, a narrative which is about um, creating um, opportunity with and through sustainability because there is a lot of opportunity down, uh, out there which we just don't grab. We just don't do it. We leave it to other people. We leave it to other countries. And then in the end, Europe is sitting there. And because we never meet our targets, because we don't see that as an opportunity, what we generate is more regulation. With more regulation, we are whinging about more bureaucracy. Um, but then there is more bureaucracy, which makes us feel that we cannot reach our targets because we are busy doing other stuff. And then, we, again, we create more regulation. Um, so it's, it's a vicious circle going downwards because everybody's now whinging about us being regulated instead of seeing the opportunity. And if we do not break through this vicious cycle, we lose. We will lose people to the, to the hard right. We will lose the entrepreneurs because they will be, sorry language, pissed off with Brussels because that's the enemy. And if we... If we don't change that, then we will lose the entire thing. And this is what I fear, because also I have 15 year old daughter, and maybe, maybe just last, sent or last few sentences to see the opportunity. My daughters are 15 years old. Obviously, I told them we shouldn't fly. And then when they were 14, they came to me and said, Dad, um, we have an idea of a, um, of a um, climate, climate neutral um, air turbine for, for, for planes. And here I am old German white man and uh, engineer and trying to tell them why it's not going to work. <laughs> I couldn't. The idea was smart. So I, I created a pitch with uh, somebody from the innovation um, head of MTU. He couldn't tell them why it's not working. So finally, coming to a professor at the T Technical University of Berlin, he could finally tell them why it's not working. But the point that I'm trying to do is they still have this vision of seeing seeing Earth, seeing other nations, seeing other people, other cultures. They're interested in seeing that. And that created this momentum of them trying to develop with 14 years old a climate neutral air turbine for planes. And this is the kind of creativity and opportunity that we need to seize because then we will take people along. We will give them hope and something that they can work for. And I can see that in my 15 year old daughter more than I can see that in a lot of the entrepreneurs that we have in Germany and other ways. So you're making a very important point in terms of taking people along. And you, Luisa, have been um, accused of polarizing society to some extent or taking on a privileged perspective and uh, uh, to some extent also having, having caused, uh, let's say, uh, a push to the right. Uh, what would you say, I'm just not you as an individual, but uh, the environmental movement, Fridays for Future, um, not being able to see the whole picture in terms of social issues uh, um, uh, so some people actually uh, are playing out um, environmental issues and social issues against each other but what would you say uh, uh, as a response uh, what can be done in order to avoid polarization uh, and the society actually falling apart so that we can take more people along and create awareness of environmental issues without really having to sacrifice social issues? Um, first of all, I think it's a um, very convenient way to blame the climate movement um, or like to, 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 uh, to demand the climate movement to fix a problem that's problems that have been built up for decades. Um, I would like to do that for a day. It sounds uh, fun. Um, 
No, I think, I, I mean, I mentioned it before. Um, we are in a new phase, um, in a new phase where we are not talking about climate, and I would say in a room that is quite empty and we can all bring in our facts and our figures and then we see where it takes us. But we are we're walking into a room that's already super crowded and that is crowded by people who have turned away, who have you know, turned away to the radical right, who have turned away to anti-science, who, um, who, are, who are lost in the case, who are polarizing in the other direction. So of course, our tactics have to change. Yet I do would make the point of course, it's convenient to, um, to tell a climate movement not to polarize. I would say one of the jobs of movements is to polarize. Not because, <laughs> and not because it's the most fun thing to do or because I don't have anything else to do in my uh, afternoons. But because in order to come together, we must be able to acknowledge differences. And we must be able to acknowledge that, as I mentioned before, we're not so all on the same side. And when we started as a, um, as a climate movement, immediately all the democratic parties came up and uh, first uh, shouted at us and then explained or considered themselves the greatest climate heroes. And now three years later, quite a few of them are turning against everything that we are fighting for, everything that even conservatives are fighting for in the EU. I think, of course, the FDP is a great example of a party that on paper wants everything the same. I mean, their party books read, you know, they look like speeches of mine. And when we look to Brussels, what is happening there in, in real time, we must be able to point this out. We must be able to name that. Not because we are thinking, you know, that's the future of climate diplomacy, but because in order to get anywhere together, we must, yeah, um, see that we're not even in the same room. Um, that's the first thing. Then, of course, and I think there's a difference between political polarization or I would say even um, narrative polarization, and then there's obviously the big task to bring people together, building unlikely alliances and so on. And um, I honestly think we've made a trillion mistakes as a movement, but the one thing that I um, find um, we're doing we're, that I'm finding we're doing well in is actually building those alliances. Um, and this is tough. We, our last big um, strikes on the streets, we uh, joined, we're joined together with um, unions, with uh, bus drivers. And let me tell you so much, building alliances with bus drivers across a country like Germany, between uh, people who would not have so much in common between climate activists and bus drivers, that took us two years. It's not something you do overnight. It's not something that you just nod off and put a logo on. It's something that you invest in because you think it's right. And in many other instances, it didn't work out. That's okay too, because you can't always, you know, be everything at every one. But to find out how to build um, alliances, how to build those bridges, I think there's a train examples we could provide as a movement. And what I think, though, is what movements, or what at least we as a movement, what we cannot do, we cannot, we can give people hope which is an important thing to do. We can shift discourses. We can even put solutions on the map that were ignored for decades. We put the, uh, we, you know, together with um, great economists, we argued for CO2 tax in Germany, which was in the first discussions we had, it considered impossible to have. No tax rates, no nothing extra. And it's, you know, and even, you know, some other soul as it was too capitalistic or whatever. And we put it on the map. You know, movements can do that. Movements cannot repair a democracy that has um, established a culture of distrust between a government and their people. That is something where asking a movement to fix those things is I would say it's, it's, it's naive, because that is something where um, governments and parties are asked, where all generations are asked, where we shouldn't take the climate question to ask climate, like we, we shouldn't put, take the climate question in a room just to fix our problems that have little to do with climate issues. Um, and so I think in this, for the sake of getting where we need to get in terms of climate, 
we need to fix the, the issues of distress that emerge in equality, that in inequality that emerge there where companies and entrepreneurs don't feel heard or seen and understood, that emerge there where three um, parties in a government can't even have a cup of tea without arguing. Um, you know, for the sake of the climate, these things need to be fixed, but the climate alone cannot fix these things. And I think we need to get that straight. Sandrine, you, you've dealt a lot with the Brussels bureaucracy. You live in Brussels. Um, you've experienced um, the, the farmers' protests uh, in, in Germany and elsewhere. And uh, the Green New Deal being kind of the, 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 the beacon of hope uh, in terms of uh, a green transition, um, one can say has been undermined. Uh, changes uh, may be made. Um, and uh, basically torpedo the, the, green, the green New de uh, Deal as uh, originally intentioned. Uh, how come that, for example, the farmers' movement is not being criticized as heavily, for example, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Fridays for Future as a movement? What is the difference, uh, maybe psychological or, or practical in, in other terms? Do you have any thoughts? And, and maybe you can say a few more words about uh, the Green New Deal mm -hmm. and whether it is the right framework to move forward. Did you want to say Yeah, 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 please. One major difference, you know, we, we are, we are deep, living in deep inequalities and in a climate crisis, but we're also living in a reality where one should listen, like an angry man must be listened to, an angry woman is hysterical, you know, one plain difference that we see on the streets. And, and hold on, let's just bring that one step further. And an angry female activist is even more hysterical, right? So, back to your question. I think power probably is the essence of what's happening right now and the difference between the European Green Deal that was seen as actually as the North Star when President von der Leyen actually proposed it. So let, let's take a step back and look at what's been happening over the last few years. We've had... People in power like Bolsonaro, we've had Trump that has raised to power. We've seen a, a real shift in terms of, and everyone's looking at each other, let's, let's be very clear. So leaders are seeing how far they can get away with. And I think this is a growing trend and we have to be truly thoughtful in the way in which we think through strategically what is happening across the globe. We're also seeing great geopolitical shifts between who has power. Europe really now being, to a certain degree, losing some of its power on the international stage as we start to obviously see the gain in power of China and, and the gain in power of the BRICS, et cetera, et cetera. Now, why is this important? Because it does, to a certain degree, play into our North Star of the Green Deal which actually should have been called a green and social deal if we truly take into consideration the way in which it's been structured and also the way in which we are shifting towards a just transition. Now, if we look at the IRA, which is happening in the United States, the Inflation Reduction Act, and we look at the comparison with the European Green Deal, the ultimate criticism is that Europe is too bureaucratic, that we're not allowing for more capital flows to get to the entrepreneurial industries that are necessary, that in the United States, the IRA, which by the way is a trillion, we're at 800 billion, so we're really pretty close, but somehow people have forgotten that, we actually have a series of different programs, Repower Europe, which is looking at energy, et cetera, which is underpinning now that one trillion, including new industrial green thinking, uh, which is kind of industry 5.0, green industry, also again trying to bring in the funding there as well. There is one big issue, and, and the reason why I brought in the leadership at the same time is because what I'm seeing is that there is a real shift across a variety of different thinkers, previous thought leaders, Macron, 
who was completely bought into the European Green Deal originally, is now talking about simplification. Many of our leaders across Europe are talking about simplification and stopping with the over-regulation. And they are really looking at what's happening across the globe, rather than focusing on the fact that the European Green Deal was our North Star. That it was a value-based proposition with a true just transition plan. And this worries me because we're mixing now politics with a big P and policy. And that is starting to really muddy up the waters where all of a sudden, actually, people like Axel, and I, I really found what you said was beautiful and so true. And there are so many leaders like yourself across Europe. I sit on many boards, industrial boards, who are truly shifting, who are putting in just transition plans, some of whom have actually already worked with their coal communities to pull out of coal, big utilities across Europe, and who are anchored in the European Green Deal, but then there's all the background noise that is taking over this North Star. And that's the problem. The background noise, which is the most powerful, big industries, oil and gas, and large-scale industrial agriculture that want to minimize, that want to in particular, ensure that they continue to have the most profits possible from a system which has enabled them to be the most profitable and have not actually distributed those profits across Europe. And that is the conflict. And you're seeing it play out in the United States as well. And you're seeing it play out in our international relationships. And so I'm going to close with this. At a time when the... Inter the Inflationary Reduction Act actually was an anti-China act. Let's be very clear. That's why it was put in place, huh? To block Chinese imports as much as possible. That's how Europe started to get pissed off, because actually our imports were also blocked, and now we've had some negotiations. But when this becomes geopolitics, with a big P, this is the moment where Europe should be looking towards Africa, and China to build a broader Green Deal that actually takes into consideration real partnerships in the area of renewables rather than going and grabbing more gas and more oil from Africa at a time when we should be decreasing and really investing both across our continent but also the continent of Africa and working with China in some interesting joint ventures that we could truly roll out to make Europe actually proud of its European Green Deal, less bureaucratic, more international, and a real game changer in terms of new industry and also social values. I'd like to respond especially um, and bring it maybe back to a very pragmatic level um, in terms of uh, German industry's perspective. <laughs> That's a no, I mean, uh, you've probably looked at the, the European, the Green New Deal and uh, from, from a corporate perspective and at the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, what uh, do, you, do you think could be done better or what has been done well and uh, how can we scale uh, the right solutions that are already um, in, in our drawer, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, there will be screaming in any case. So either you, you increase bureaucracy and policies, and um, there will be huge screaming because obviously it's a lot of bureaucracy, and I, I get this. And there will be screaming in raising um, taxes. So, for example, the ETS or the, um, the, the German carbon tax, um, which we have since 2021, um, however, I would have wished that the European Union would have raised these ETS or uh, reduced the cap of the, ET, uh, the ETS quicker, yeah. Yeah. and uh, Germany raised the, the, uh, uh, the carbon tax quicker. In 2023, they stopped it. This would, in my point of view, this would have a way bigger effect. Why? Because it increases costs. And if, I mean, 
companies can, can are really good in cost cutting and develop new technologies that avoid cost. So this would create, and I'm not talking about uh, future technologies that will remove carbon from the air, I'm just talking about carbon reduction in the first place as much as we can. Sorry, Axel, can yeah. I just ask you, are you talking about carbon pricing or are you talking yeah. about carbon taxation? Well, uh, I'm actually, either way, I, 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 I don't really care and I just hope that the CSRD will create some taxation at some end because, it, again, it, it raises tax. It, it would be great if we would have to pay for products um, like fossil fuel more because it's integrated in the price over the carbon tax. Um, I just would like to see higher prices for non-sustainable behavior because that would lead the companies into um, investing into more sustainable behavior. Um, and this, for me, is where, where I see where the European Union could have done probably better. The CSID, for example, it's, it's over 900 data points. I mean, also there, if we are true, like for our entire group, we are looking at probably 280 data points for a single company, 450, but it's a lot. Um, and what is it worth for? I mean, at some point, EU regulation needs to kick in and somehow um, make companies pay for high carbon emissions or whatsoever if it's really worthwhile. Um, obviously, I'm also trying to think entrepreneur there, so I usually tend to tell my people, um, we, we are gathering a lot of data. And I, I, I was, 12 years I was working in digitalization and um, I always told people that um, data is the new gold and you can do so much with data. And now we are supposed to just gather data and send it to Brussels? I mean, really? So... Can I just reflect yeah. on this? Because having been part, unfortunately, of the Brussels bubble around the taxonomy for two and a half years, which decided what was green and brown and then got hijacked by Macron and this lovely country in terms of bringing in nuclear and, and gas. I think it's exactly right what you say. And I think we realized in two and a half years of working with financiers, with data analysts, with environmentalists, with the European Commission, that what we were doing was we were creating such a complex system and requiring so many different criteria and data points that companies would really have a difficult time. And that realization has been very important because you're right, one of the key conversations now in Brussels is how do we reduce the bureaucracy? How do we reduce the reporting requirements? Not to decrease the important ambition of what we're trying to do, but at least enable companies to focus on meeting that ambition rather than on reporting. And I think that is fundamental. But, but I, I would have really loved the screaming about higher costs or taxation more than um, the screaming about bureaucracy. Because that really pisses people off in regards to the European Union and the Green Deal. Um, I mean, obviously there would be a lot of friction with higher taxation, but it would at least lead the investments to the right direction. Just reporting 900 data points will not make any impact. And, and that's my problem with it. But then I would add, you know, we've campaigned around the taxation for, um, yeah, obviously way too many hours, as everyone did. And we, we spent the last 24 hours of the vote camping in front of the, of the parliament. It was all a disaster. And yet, yet technically it was such an important piece of legislation, right? It was technically such a, a crucial step to go to say, okay, let's, let's really tr translate one to one. What does climate justice mean? in the first step on a market, on an investment market. What does it mean? Um, and yet, I would, you know, you, you say there wasn't a spirit in the room. We didn't feel the spirit either. As activists, we were like, yeah, we do it because it's like a to-do thing, but it wasn't something that we, you know, that we felt as we did many other things before. When we uh, sued the German government, when we fought for the first climate law in Germany, we felt that we knew that is the one thing we have to do, and millions of other people felt that too. The taxonomy felt like, you know, what finance and, you know, paragraphs feel like, nothing, nothingness and void and annoyance. And I think that is something that, you know, coming back to all the big plans, the missing piece that we are seeing everywhere, why is the Inflation Reduction Act, which compared to the size of the U.S. Um, economy, is, a, you know, very medium 
situation compared to what needs to be done in terms of the climate, very, you know, average ambition, you know, fell. why is it such a great story? Why is it talked about? Because, and I think that is something really to learn from, they understood that the story around what we do and the idea we're putting into the world is just as important as what is in it. And, you know, what, you know, you refer to the Second World War in Germany, everyone talks about the Wirtschaftswunder. You know, d technically not the greatest of times, but there was a star again. There was something, you know, there was a light out there to work towards. And I think that is something reflecting on Europe right now, running up to these crucially important elections is clearly missing. So eventually, you don't know what you're doing the extra reporting for. You don't know what you're putting the extra work for. You don't know what you're getting into the fights for even, and eventually you stop getting into the fights. So whenever you come up with a great plan, acknowledge that you need a great story too. So whether it's in politics, whether that's an economy, whether that's an entrepreneurism, whether that's what we do as a movement, it's the same thing. And obviously that is something, a capacity that has yet to be built up because we're not seeing it. And in one of the, mo the continents heating up the fastest of all, that is at the same time the least prepared for that heat. In a continent at the same time, that is one of the, maybe the last you know, beacon of democracy, as you want to say it, in a time of rising um, right extremism across the globe, you know, there would be moments where you think we could also dance on the tables and be like, yes, man, let's defend this. It's not great, but it's not getting any better, better if the radical right takes over. And there's so much yet to win. So obviously, um, yeah, looking into the room, lots to do. So you're, you're saying that visions, visions are as important as the content, basically. And earlier you basically said uh, James Bond or Elon Musk uh, um, may hijack in some ways the story. But aren't role models important that also stand for a new future as it could be in terms of positive sto storytelling or in terms of alternative first, futures? You go first, Axel. I, I just wanted to make one point because I've seen your OMR um, speech. Um, which was a great speech. Um, with marketing conference in yes, Hamburg. Yeah. Uh, online marketing rocks us. And um, with the one thing, you, you, you blamed the companies that were not doing good, which is perfectly fine. I would have loved... If which I would say is my job. <laughs> you know, no, no, that's, and, and I'm saying that's perfectly fine. I would have done the same, by the way. But what I was missing is, because that's what he's just referring to, why didn't you say, talk about some of the companies that are doing really well, like VD, for example, with Antje van Davids, For Tomorrow with Ruth von Heusinger, who's over there? I can, you know why? A lot of companies approached me before and said, Louisa, don't you want to mention what we... I honestly, I'm, I'm fighting on so many ends, I didn't want to get in that one fight of which companies to mention and which not to mention. And having been speak, like having spoken on the largest marketing conference of Europe, I would kind of trust in these companies to do the great marketing themselves for the great stuff. But to be like, I give you that point. I did consider that, but I thought, you know what? I'm going to this great marketing conference to tell 70,000 people to quit their job if they're involved in greenwashing. I think I have enough, enough to do for now. So can I, I want to, thank you. But <laughs> Very valid points. And, and Jörg, you, you pointed towards role models. I mean, we have a conversation with policymakers all the time. What about highlighting the great policies that we do have? What about highlighting the great leaders that we do have? And, you know, even conversations, and, and I know that in Germany, there are very mixed reviews with regard to the president of the European Commission, President Ursula von der Leyen. But I can promise you that she felt pretty alone when she came forward with the European Green Deal. And yet she's a card-carrying conservative. And I'm the number one person that goes out and says, and I'm going to be very honest, I don't vote conservative, who says, look at this woman who had the courage to go forward and put a package of legislation that no one else did. But that her predecessor put in place. 
more no. or less. No. Oh, Some that is which. such baloney. That is such baloney because she had the creativity to create the vision of a European Green Deal. And by the way, Juncker was drinking his life away half the time. So let's be clear. Let's be clear. And, and I, having worked with Barroso, yes, Barroso, to a certain degree, did start to prepare the terrain. But there's a difference, and that's what we're talking about, vision, right? There's a difference between preparing the terrain and understanding the vision. And she was massacred by people in her party. So who came out and said, well done, girl. Well done you for taking a step forward. And who's now trying to encourage her when actually she's getting massacred again? We have to bring forward our own good policymakers and entrepreneurs. And one of the reasons, Louisa, by the way, that the good guys don't market is because they're out there actually doing the job. Yes. And I have seen time and time again, it is the power mongers and the bad guys that are spending God knows how much money to make sure that they continue to win. Whereas all of the incredible small and medium-sized enterprises and all those many of whom are family-owned offices because they do have a vision, but as well as our utilities across Europe, most of whom have already started to transition, some of the car manufacturers that have transitioned, but we do not highlight that. And so coming back to the hate and the love, Think of your own psychosis. If no one is giving you love when you're doing the right thing, you're going to start going in the opposite direction because you don't feel that love. And that's would, really um, important. I would add, though, that, you know, when we look at, I mean, people will find their role models and they will uh, take them, I think, looking at um, how we perceive our own history and the history of social movements, we see that this history is written mostly about, you know, the man who made the differences. That's why we know the, 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 the scientist's man and the uh, politician's man. And, you know, it's, 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 and now, now we see that his the stories of collectives and women are emerging. You know, they, they, they call them hidden women. So the women behind the big Nobel Prize guys, you know, who were kind of, kind of doing part of the work, you know, that stuff is uncovered. Our well-being economy women, all of whom were women apart from Wales. Yes, exactly. So I, I would kind of challenge the notion that it's like a, a law of nature that we need that one man to come and to, to find that most of the great changes fought for by social rights or social movements or but brought forward by entrepreneurs was a collective action. And we reduced that retrospectively to this one man that we like to tell a story about. Or sometimes, you know, it might be a woman for, you know, as an accident. But technically, that is how we tell the stories. And I think, you know, that's maybe one reason why lead politicians in Germany were so... I think really authentically surprised when a movement led by young women emerged because that's, you know, out of all the things they did, they didn't expect the change to come from. And um, so when we look for those role models, I think it's also, it's also maybe a moment to challenge why we're looking for that one person or maybe it's something we were trained to do whilst having a life that was built and fought for and defended by a democracy and human rights, all of that, by people who came together. And I think that's uh, not only honest to ourselves, but that also allows us to understand that we cannot do this stuff by ourselves. You know, looking at people like you, you won't get anything closer to climate neutrality or maybe even climate justice or so um, in, in your um, institution, in, in your office, if it isn't for endless other of others, colleagues of yours in all different sectors kind of coming together. And last point, it's okay, I think, to acknowledge also the climate crisis wasn't produced by a single man. It was also produced by a collective. Obviously, companies, you know, main companies, but it was also many of them were the major driver behind that. But technically, it was a great group work that lasted a century um, where even normal people with the best intentions, just following up their dreams, were a huge part of. And now we suddenly expect to the good change to come from a few individuals that we really need to feel good ourselves, knowing that we put unimaginable and stupid burden on them and create, obviously, a huge disappointment for everyone else, that just doesn't sound like resilience to me. 
that sounds a bit stupid and very easy and convenient, but not really honest about where we are. Would you like to res respond briefly, Axel, and then I'm handing over to the audience for, for questions. Yeah, and within the companies that at least that I, I work with, I see a lot of this cooperation actually happening and not waiting for the one. Um, and it's, it's male and female. And, um, and you're right. Um, we usually mention the, the male, and that's why I think it's so important also to mention the companies that are owned and run by, by female CEOs and female owners that are going the, the path. Um, Anne-Marie Grossmann from Georg Marienhütte in the steel industry. Freaking, expen uh, free, freaking difficult, but she's trying. Oh, I mentioned Ruth over there. I mentioned uh, Antje van Debitz. And obviously, they are not marketing themselves because um, uh, they don't feel they, they should. And that's probably the problem. That's why we need to probably mention them um, as well and give them some credits for what they've been doing. Um, but coming back to the point of cooperation, I mean, within the companies, there's a huge um, insecurity of how this is now going to work, how you do the CSID, how do, how you, do, uh, how do you reduce your carbon footprint by 50% or more. Um, so I, I do see a lot of cooperation um, in there uh, and the willingness to cooperate. I think what we need to do is, or we need to accomplish is to make the, the, the people in lead, the CEOs, male or female, to make, make them aware that it is possible to do that transformation. And there are other companies that already did and are willing to help. Because that might take away a little bit of the barrier that they currently see. Um, because they, it's the unknown for them. They, they fear like hell that they have higher costs, that they lose markets, that they lose power, that they lose status, and so forth. Um, and if there's nobody that shows them that there is an opportunity and that there is, there is a way to do that transformation, it'll just be more difficult, it'll just take longer, and maybe it'll be impossible. So, uh, no questions from, from the audience. Uh, questions from... From the audience, um, Hendrik is walking around, so there's a question here, Thorsten, if you could. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, first of all, for for the for the panel and uh, and please please introduce yourself uh, by oh, name sorry, and, yeah, and yeah. affiliation. That would be appreciated. Can, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, my name is Thorsten Seving. Um, affiliated with uh, klimataler.com. Uh, check it out. Uh, well, uh, I, I would like to maybe make a couple of brief comments and maybe keep, a question. Keep the comments yes, short, please. I, I kept, so I, I really like the group thing of, of Luisa. Uh, how do you build groups, basically? And uh, how, how can you uh, uh, create that uh, through the acknowledging the conflict of that people get together or that you have to acknowledge when people come together that there is conflict and that you're not necessarily in the same room. Um, and, and my answer to that would be that all the people in the room acknowledge that conflict is the strongest driver of change. That's what uh, a woman uh, in, in Northern Ireland, one of the Peace um, uh, Nobel... Uh, okay. She, she got the Peace Nobel Prize as Question, a please. woman for peace in the 1980s. And I just wanted to put this in that there is a lot of uh, female peacemakers around, uh, not only in Rwanda, and et cetera. Anyway, so the conflict as a driver of change is actually, the, the, is actually possible to, to build bridges because that's what you want. And my question would be, how can we get into the same room by building a bridge? So can I, I mean, we've been doing a lot of building bridges. I've spent my entire career, in fact, it's on my CV that I facilitate difficult conversations and build bridges. I worked with the oil and gas sector. I worked with kings and governments, et cetera, et cetera. So there are lots of people trying to build bridges. I think that that is still fundamental. But what I've really noticed we've gotten wrong is in this period of the poly crisis, people are lost in a variety of different ways. And our role is somehow to build a bridge towards what is it that's important for them. So if you work with industry, it could be 
how is it that I can continue to function within the poly crisis and transform? What does that look like? And therefore, what is that conversation? If you speak to a farmer, it's going to be different. And so I think part of the bridge building today is both empathy and understanding and giving forward that level of compassion, targeting the real needs of that person or that industry or whatever, and then figuring out how do we function, all of us together, through chaos. Because we are now in the greatest chaotic period we have ever seen. We will get thrown black swans left, right, and center. And so how do we plan and build resilience within chaos? And I think that those radical partnerships that Louisa referred to are absolutely fundamental. But part of that is really understanding how we do that within the context of chaos which actually was not what we were facing, at least on this continent, since the 70s. We definitely were facing it coming out of the Second World War. And, and maybe from a very practical uh, perspective, um, like we always have been in conflict in how do we do the decarbonization going in our companies. Um, and we, we always hit the wall against CapEx and investment and the CFOs um, who didn't see that as a value. Um, and when we started something technical like a margin abatement cost analysis, um, don't know if everybody's familiar with that, what you pretty much uh, analyze is what's the decarbonization potential and what's the net present value, so do you actually earn money with that in the end? Um, and by doing that, um, and with the, the clear statement from the company, if we do everything on that map, all the measures that we could do, we will be slightly more profitable in the end. That opened doors because we were starting speaking their language. And now that was actually one of the, um, and I know it sounds stupid, but it was some, one of the groundbreaking uh, measures that we took in doing that marginal abatement cost analysis everywhere because then we were talking their language and then they understood, okay, it's, it can actually also save me money. Okay, let's go. So we could at least start with all the measures that, um, that were actually making us more profitable. And that opened doors. And then we could start to talk and then we could say, hey, because we're now earning more money with these measures, can we probably do the other ones as well, which are getting better over time because technology involves. So what I'm trying to say is, um, you, in Germany we say, du musst die Leute da abholen, wo sie uh, an der Bushaltestelle stehen. Um, so you need to pick them up where they are and then talk their language, and that helps. Yeah. And, and it's probably not the best solution because it's still within the economic system. So talking of feminism, I've only seen men raise their arms, so uh, there is uh, one woman over there. Yeah. Thanks. So my name is Lisa Fiedler. I work um, or I'm affiliated with the Wackler Holding SE. And uh, I would like to ask you, Luisa, um, how do you manage to keep your energy and your resilience? Because so I'm now in sustainability management for about around about 10 years. And sometimes I get really like tired of explaining and showing the vision. And I'm an impatient person. So I want to get things done very fast. And yeah, so how, how, how do you manage this? Because I assume um, you get a lot of very friendly letters and have a lot of yeah, talking fights at the demonstrations, and uh, yeah, I, I really like your spirit. <laughs> Boundaries. It's a magic. <laughs> Very, um, uh, yeah, I think that's... Uh, and if I, if I lose my, um, you know, as long as I'm happy, uh, you know, I get to uh, annoy some very fossil fuel men out there. And so keeping the spirits up is not only, you know, it's not only good for the soul, but I would say it's quite a useful strategy. And the, in the movement, we say we fight, we dance, we fight, we dance. And I think it's a good, uh, it's a good formula. So uh, I think next, Louis, Louis is next. Thank you. Thank you so very much. My name is uh, Louis Klein. 
I could speak to you as uh, Secretary General of the International Federation for Systems Research or as Dean of the European School of Governance. Um, I speak to you as an organic wine farmer. In the, 1990, in the 1980s, we were fully enthusiastic and young, and we were fighting fights against the old far scent with their extractive way of farming. We exhausted ourselves. We tried labels like Ecovin or um, others to certify. We exhausted us further in the bureaucracy. What was it actually that in the end made us turn our winery into a fully organic wine farm or slow food? It was the welcome, it was the warm embrace that facilitated for us. So the question is here, well, I heard a lot of conflict being offered. I heard polarizing is my job. One of the great philosophers of our time came up with a legendary question, the Turner question. What's love got to do with it? And that's my question to the panel. Well, I think I started talking about the color over there of love and hate, so I fully agree with you. Um, but I think what's interesting is just last week, and that's how I, I actually injured my knee, um, I was with Johan Rockström, other scientists, but also economists and thought leaders. We were discussing what are those positive tipping points. So you talked about slow food as actually a positive tipping point. How can we envisage new positive tipping points? whether they be social or environmental. And, and I think that's what we need to think about. So if we want to bring the organic wine industry and obviously food sector, what does that look like in terms of the positive tipping point? And, and you know, you can talk about the suffragettes and you can talk about so many other movements that were positive tipping points in bringing the vote to women, etc. We need to go through history and think through what were those trigger mechanisms that enabled that to happen. And then what is it now in the 21st century that we need? And that does carry with it a trend element. I mean, I often talk about Cambridge Analytica for good, by the way using social media, you know, you can shift very quickly, whether it be through tennis shoes that are fully circular and bioproducts, etc., by making them cool. What was the slow food effect? What are the other effects that will enable us to move the bar much further? And, and that is something that, that we really need to address and to look at. And there are a variety of different examples where we're starting to see that happen, especially in the clothing sector and in some of the bioplastics, recycled plastics, circularity, et cetera, where we're starting to see some tipping points. Thank you for that. And, and that, that's definitely one of the mistakes I think companies did in the past. They were thinking, um, we just do make a product more sustainable and then we will sell it and then we will justify um, um, higher costs or higher prices for it. That's completely wrong. Um, what we need to create is super good products which are also sustainable and circular and so forth because otherwise they will not grow, they will not um, scale and then we won't have impact. Um, so I think and, and I see the same thing in the companies that's starting to shift and we get the first evidence that these kind of products actually sell better than non-sustainable or less sustainable products. Um, yeah, it, it takes time, but that's the big mistake that we have done in the past. Next question. Uh, Daniel Dahm, a uh, member of the German Association Club of Rome and Council of the World Future Council and also one of the founding members of the Arts and Nature Social Club. Thank you very much and I have a, a question that goes to Sandrine and Luisa mostly. 
Um, because the topic of today is the topic of international collaboration as well, and uh, especially you, Sandrine, pointed out the global inequality and the north-south conflict. So my question would be, as we know that we are living in the extractive con continent, the root of the problem, because from here it came to the United States and from the Western European societies, we did spread the Western model of wealth and consume patterns all over the world, inclusive the extractive industrial strategy. Um, what would you see as the next political steps that we need to uh, unfold a global movement into a just development? Because uh, the degradation of the global livelihoods that are extracted for, for the gain of financial profits uh, is in the moment the dominant uh, component of our economic ideology that we call today the financial capitalism. And uh, I also want to add something, and that is not the same like a market economy. The market economy includes subsistency, and that includes the empowerment of people all over the world, including men, by the way, not only women, because the movement of peace and ecology was uh, grown on the shoulders of also some men. Me, 40 years ago, I was painting posters for the peace and green movement already. Ex excellent um, question. So first of all, we need feminist men um, or men that have feminine qualities and we need women that also have masculine qualities. So. I, I think that um, the key point comes to Louisa's point around colonialism. Uh, the starting factor is to admit our colonialistic tendencies, which are both an, an, a continuum of the way in which we engage with different countries, but also which we have enabled multinationals to follow through those patterns, because our multinationals continue to actually pillage the global commons. So that conversation is a conversation that actually is happening at the international level. If you look at the Bridgetown Initiative, which is being led by Mia Motley, the Prime Minister of Barbados, and the way in which different countries, especially the BRICS, but also countries in the South, are starting to say we need a completely different financial architecture. And that different financial architecture is looking at debt cancellation, it's looking at special drawing rights. It's looking at creating the fiscal space in countries in the South so that they can transition. Because let's be very clear. Oops. Mazel tov. <laughs> the most important thing right now is, is to actually be able to cancel debt and in particular trade deficits so that countries can invest in the just transition because they can't. So that's the first point. So shifting from colonialistic tendencies, having an open conversation around that, understanding what that looks like in terms of the international financial architecture. But then the next key step is what I was saying about the European Green Deal. It's embracing different countries that we can work with to build a global Green Deal that is both a green and social deal and that understands that we may not hit our GDP figures because actually we're starting to put in place indicators that go beyond GDP and place a value on other things and doing that together. And so that conversation is actually live, as is the new international financial architecture conversation. But we need to make them not only live, but implemented. And that's the role of the Club of Rome. It's the role of other organizations that are working with us. It's the role of the youth in calling for that to happen. It's the role of entrepreneurs and companies who are saying, no, this is no longer just about shareholder value. This is about economic value for global value chains, not just European value chains. And therefore, that takes into consideration the rest of the world. So that would be one way of potentially answering your very complex and difficult question. Would you like to respond as well? I think Sandrine uh, uh, pointed it out wonderfully. Um, I would maybe just add, because it was uh, so um, 
uh, maybe we could learn from that tonight. It's a um, it's an interesting mechanism whenever I'm on a stage and someone talks about the fact that obviously the patriarchy has to do something with the climate crisis or just the fact that we are living in unequal systems where women are listened to less and so on. Some men <laughs> will stand up and say, well, but I'm also doing something. And that is great. And um, thank you for, for being that person tonight. That is wonderful. And we have the greatest men who did the, 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 the greatest things of all time. And there's, um, of, ob luckily enough, we have plenty of room to cherish that and to give prizes and to make movies and to tell the stories. That's all great. Um, all of that just teaches us to distinct between the root problems um, and the systems we live in and the solutions we provide. And that's a great difference. But because we have great solutions, then kind of, and because we have great examples of the opposite, then kind of washing down at least the gravity of the problems that are still in place and the roots of the inequalities that we see every day, I think that tends to, um, yeah, distract. And that, you know, comes to a, the questions of colonial infrastructures and um, systems. And, you know, we, we see that at the climate conferences where, you know, everyone attempts to be on an eye side, but we do know, of course, um, some people are listened to more, some people are listened to less. We know that it took decades for an indigenous um, for indigenous groups to be even acknowledged as a formal part of that. It took decades to acknowledge their wisdom as part of what we do at the climate conferences. And the same accounts for all marginalized groups. So I think having the, yeah, having the stamina there to acknowledge um, when being part of a, when being on the profiting side of inequality, of unequal systems, that, yeah, helps. Can I just build on I'm really sorry, very quickly, very, very quickly. What Louisa was pointing to is a very important word called hypocrisy. And, and I do want to bring up, and I forgot to mention it, actually, in answer to your question. I mean, let's go back to even the 100 billion that were promised at the COPs. The fact that I actually facilitated a very high-level leadership pledge on forestry where the Bezos Fund promised millions to indigenous people and stop deforestation, and none of that money has actually been given. How can we continue to even think that either indigenous peoples who are the protectors of our land or farmers or anyone else who have been given these promises time and time again and don't see the actual money are going to continue to support what we're trying to do? So I think we have to remind ourselves hypocrisy is killing that potential to actually move towards an economy of love. So one last question from the audience, and I think, uh, Micah, un unfortunately, we are uh, running a bit out of time, but Micah, please. Okay, I will not make it a question. I, I Maybe a little inspiration. I'm Micah Ziegler. I'm a creative alchemist. Uh, we are talking Club of Rome, arts and nature. I'm missing a little bit the creative idea coming through the back door. We are trying to find a lot of solutions. Um, I'm extremely inspired. I just want to share three words. I just came back from Lagos. I built a table of hope with a huge community. Um, it's the largest deforestation in Nigeria. And um, it was amazing how many very poor people, but people from all walks of life came together and wrote their hopes on wood and we built this table together as a conversation piece. All I'm trying to say is maybe we should try to create universal ideas with, like I heard t tonight, narratives or stories that all of us can understand, not the academics, not all the people who are in this room and trying to solve things, but we have to work bottom up and speak a language that everyone understands. and. Um, this is what I want to give back to you. I can, I can tell you many stories about this, but um, thank you for tonight. Thank you very much. Yeah, just, just give me a second. Yeah.
be, yeah, you can respond, you're welcome to respond, but also uh, there was a question on YouTube as well, which I liked, a question to Louisa, but I'd like to extend it to all of you in conjunction with the response to the last question, which is what are the top three action steps that we can take in order to move to a more collaborative and positive future? So a response uh, to both of these points, and then I'd like to wrap up. Would you like to, to start, Sandrine? Well, who's the we, first of all? Because that's, is it we as individuals or we as leaders? Um, if it's the we as leaders, I, I really believe right now the most collaborative step that we can take is rally around the European elections and make sure that we save our democracy and our freedom. The next one is then to ensure that we work together with industry and youth and other actors to really embody the European Green Deal and move it forward. And then in terms of this very important idea, I, what I wanted to say was let's not make this the Last Supper, but instead a table of hope. And I really like that. And so I would like to pledge that we will continue to create tables of hope through conversations that are not just speaking to the converted, because I probably think that the majority of people in here are, but instead bringing up unusual suspects, unusual conversations, to make sure that we do win the European elections for peace, freedom, and democracy, and that we do move forward with our North Star, which is a social and green deal. Action steps. The three action steps. They just weren't. They just weren't the usual Cartesian action steps. Sorry. Um. I, uh, I think. I mean, obviously, all the all the lists, all the books are out there. Um, I think one is. Um, remember this, um, these studies that show that people who walk to work towards through a neighborhood with many solar panels are significantly more likely to like solar panels, to vote for parties that want solar panels, and to install solar panels. What I mean is, don't wait for anyone here or anyone out there to do the job. What, what you're doing, wherever you are on YouTube, <laughs> um, that matters, and that matters more than you might think. Everyone is a role model, and the people that influence us the most are the people closest to us. So when, whenever you do something in, like for, for a just um, future, or if you're not doing something for a just future, you are impacting others, you're influencing others. And I think that is the most beautiful and most hopeful thing of all, because it, does, it means we do not depend on anyone out there to do everything for us, but it's up to us. Um, it's not on our shoulders only, it's also in our hands. And I think that is, um, yeah, radically hopeful. And um, that's the one thing. Um, second thing, of course, is um, the climate crisis wasn't created with bullet points and, uh, you know, very um, neat arguments written down on little leaflets handed out to the people. Uh, the climate crisis was created with the best car commercials of all time, telling people that this is the thing that will make you happy and uh, everything else connected to it. So um, if you happen to be creative, get your creativity out and find out what is, it, what is the picture that we show to people to uh, get involved. And that accounts for everyone else too, right? Everyone else, wherever you work. Figure out what is the thing that is too good to be true and then go and do it. Um, and thirdly, I think very uh, realpolitisch, uh, we must do everything we can for this European elections in Germany. We also have Landtagswahlen. Uh, uh, we, you know, it's not that like we are past the times where you could be unpolitical. This doesn't exist anymore. That notion. You are you are you're for freedom or you're against it. You are in favor of democracy or you're against it. Um, and the the wiggle room between where you kind of could just flow and look what happens that doesn't exist anymore. Um, so I think that's a uh, that's a moment for the most hopeful and most loving um, yeah um, act of resistance and resilience we we need out there. And looking into this room, people will have networks. 
of maybe people who aren't yet convinced, who might stay at home, who um, haven't understood the urgency of what we are up to. So this is, I think, a moment to feel important because we are at this moment. Yeah, fight for democracy, um, totally for it, but I, I'll, I'll have three more points. So um, I take that as, well, unfortunately, it's not granted, but um, as um, uh, ne unbelievably necessary. So the first is um, we need to create some kind of narrative vision or something that catches people and takes them away. Um, I don't want to call it a story or a narrative again, I'm sorry, but um, something that people can follow. A dream, yeah, dream would be good. It should be more than a dream, though, a bit more tangible, but, um, yeah, a vision whatsoever. Yeah. You don't have dreams, you have plans. Yeah, I'm a mechanic. The American dreams turned into the American nightmares. Okay, I'm... I'm talking about action points, so can I? Um, so, so, but I'm a mechanical engineer, so I'm, it's, I need something tangible. So um, a vision or whatsoever, something that we can follow. And for me, that was ankle fake. That catched me. That's why I moved into that company. Um, then secondly, get out there. Um, talk to people. Convince them. Show them the stuff that works. Um, make them, make them, um, give them um, courage um, that it actually works. Um, because then they will start the movement. Um, and thirdly, um, do stuff. So I, I really like the point that you noted out with um, photovoltaics. Made the same experience in my suburb. Um, I had one in 2013. Took another five years until, and I think that's the critical one, th until we got the critical mass, and then it just exploded. So nearly everybody now has a photovoltaic system. I see that with elect electrical vehicles right now. To getting to the critical mass where this becomes something yeah, it seems to work, seems to be comfortable, seems to be all right, it doesn't seem to create too much of tension that I need to change my behavior. So when we get to that critical mass, um, things start to work, and therefore each and every single one of us can do something and create that critical mass. It's not good enough to wait for some others to do that. So thanks very much for a very rich discussion and uh, I know that a lot of people wanted to ask more questions but I hope our presenters will have a few more minutes to spare to network with, with everybody and, and share more thoughts. But uh, let me just point out uh, a few more thoughts uh, and, and, and key words that, that I picked up. So there's clearly hope, maybe a table of hope, or hope in general. I think uh, that's certainly very important. Dreams, narratives, uh, feminine values also to be embodied and in, in incorporated by man so that it's a shared approach uh, because we don't need more division i think we need more collaboration between all kinds of factions um, there's positive stories uh, movements movements cannot repair trust i think it's it's up to all of us to repair trust and avoid polarization uh, we certainly need a lot of resilience moving forward and we need each other. I think we really need to care and uh, look out for each other in order to make a difference and we need a world in balance. Uh, certainly the world uh, is, is everything but in balance and we need to overcome hypocrisy as Sandrine uh, pointed out very point poignantly. So um, last not but, but not least I'd like to uh, highlight some of my team members uh, without whom it wouldn't have been possible to organize the event, especially Manuel, Fabian, Hendrik, Andrea, Torsten, and, and Peter. If you could uh, stand up briefly, and uh, these are also people you can talk to about Arts and Nature Social Club. <laughs> It's a, it's a membership-based organization which uh, builds on community, and this is why we run these uh, events based on a lot of volunteer work in order to build community for a better world. And I hope you can all par become part of this movement as well, which incorporates the arts and hopefully inspires you, which is another key word for me, because often the world lacks inspiration, and this is really something we want to convey tonight. 
And um, uh, this is, I think, the right moment to hand over back to the musicians in order to share some of their beautiful inspiration based on hope and, and a lot of art. Thanks very much for attending. And uh, maybe stay a little, just a moment. Hello. Yes, mom. Yeah. No, they didn't talk about Congo. Yes, we talked about climate, but they didn't talk about Congo. I know. Really? Yes, I thought, I thought they would mention something about the Congo. I mean, Congo, you know, like climate, you know, second biggest rainforest and, you know, and all the mineral resources and all the iPhones and, yeah, maybe next time. Okay, my mom, I have to play, I have to play something. <laughs>
watch her leave me that long time ago. Don't wait for my resurrection. Cause the departure made me that long time ago. From all creation, you are the one I admire the most. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. You never come home. Saturdays and Sundays up at home. Thanks. 